Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this webinar on the OECD's Teaching and Learning International Survey, otherwise known as TALIS, a survey that asks teachers about their working conditions, practice, and career development, among a long list of other things. Results from the latest cycle of TALIS will be launched on June 19th in the first of two volumes, which is entitled Teachers and School Leaders as Lifelong Learners. Andrea Schleicher, Director of Education and Skills at the OECD, is joining us today to talk about what to expect from this latest cycle of TALIS, as well as what we learned from the previous cycle in 2013. We are also joined by Pablo Fraser and Karin Tremblay from the TALIS team, who will be taking questions with Andreas after the presentation. So please feel free to send your questions at any time to edu.contact at oecd.org. That's edu dot contact at oecd.org or you can try and use the chat function in the, the webinar. Also the PowerPoint that Andreas is presenting will be made available online. Andreas, over to you. Thank you, Henry, and uh, welcome. And I'm really proud to present this uh, pre-launch for TALIS. TALIS is a survey that is very special to us at the OECD because it's the world's first survey that looks at the world of education through the eyes of teachers. Now, everybody talks about teachers, you know, children about, talk about their teachers, parents talk about what they think the teachers of their children do, um, policymakers talk about what they believe is best for teachers, but we rarely listen to the voice of teachers. So TALIS is a survey that does precisely this. We're going to present the results on the 19th of June. What I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about the nature of this survey, share with you some results from previous TALIS surveys that give you an idea of you know, what the kind of data the survey collects and then goes through what exactly we're going to present on the 19th of June. The context for teaching is challenging. We all know that. Students are confronted with a rapidly changing world, need to equip themselves with changing skill sets, and that means teachers need to deliver changing and evolving curricula. We also see very significant changes in the work environment and uh, of teachers and school leaders. Think about growing diversity in classrooms, uh, but also in changing, you know, digitalization having an impact on teaching. And then the profession itself is becoming more diverse, more complex, uh, with, and teachers need to sort of face those kinds of challenges. And that also means that teachers and school principals as well these days really need to become lifelong learners. Now, the students are not going to become lifelong learners if they don't see their teachers also as lifelong learners. So this is something that we put particular emphasis in this very first volume of the TALIS survey. Uh, basically, you know, everybody talks about that the quality of an education system can never exceed the quality of their teachers. But there's another side to this, and that's that the quality of teachers and principals can never exceed the environment that we provide for them, the quality of their training, kind of practices they deploy, their opportunities to collaborate and to develop further, and the environments in which they teach and in which schools operate. And that's basically what Thales tries to explore through the eyes of teachers. You think about this developing as a profession means that we need to recruit the best and brightest into the teaching profession. We'll need to think about how to support teachers as they continue to develop and improve and further develop their practice. It's one thing to get great people into the teaching profession. It's another to make sure that their work is not just financially, but also intellectually attractive so that we retain effective teachers and recognize them and create meaningful pathways for the development and growth. And then, of course, what does society believe about teaching as a profession? Let me start with an overview of TALIS. TALIS is, as I already mentioned, the world's first international survey that looks at teaching and learning through the eyes of teachers. There have been three surveys up to now. In 2008, we started with 24 education systems. In 2013, that expanded to 34 education systems. And now the 2018 survey covers 48 education systems. 
Some countries have also extended the survey, looking not only at middle school, lower secondary education, but extending that to primary and also upper secondary schooling. And we're going to present those results later as well. In this chart, you just see the quantitative growth in country participation, which shows that increasing number of countries uh, believe in the importance of looking at education through the eyes of teachers to understand the views and perspectives of teachers really well to design effective teacher policies and practices. TALIS has always been a partnership. The OECD is coordinating this effort, but we have great uh, <coughs> support from an international research consortium that puts the instruments together and explores them. We have worked closely with uh, teacher unions across countries uh, and, of course, the education systems that implement the survey. And we got quite generous support financially from the European Commission as well. Let me, just to give you a taste of what TALIS looks like, show you some results from earlier surveys. I want to emphasize again, these are not the 2018 results. They're going to come out on the 19th of June. These are results from the last survey that just give you a taste of the kind of data the survey provides. First of all, this chart shows you the share of teachers who believe or who say that um, their teaching profession is valued by society. And you can see here on the chart in Singapore and Korea and uh, Finland, uh, you well over half of the teachers who see themselves and their profession as valued by society. But then on the other side, you can see the other extreme countries like France and Sweden, where this is just five in a hundred. So there's a lot of variability across countries in the perception that teachers have about their standing in society. Now you can say, well, these are just the views of teachers on you know, what they believe society thinks. Um, does it really matter? But in fact, when we square those data with outcomes from our PISA survey that looks at the quality of learning outcomes, you can see that it's a pretty strong relationship between the percentage of teachers who say that teaching is valued in society and the share of top performers in mathematics that we find on the PISA survey. We do not know much about the causal nature of this relationship. It could be that in countries where teaching is valued, you know, the best and brightest apply to become teachers and they're going to deliver great work and the results will be good. It could also be that <clears throat> uh, the other way around, basically, where teaching is <clears throat> where, where, where educational results are good, teachers are going to be valued for those outcomes. Uh, but what we do see is that there seems to be a pattern that uh, the status of teaching in society and learning outcomes seem to be related. We also know from Talis that the um, uh, age profile of teachers is quite varied. You can see in Singapore, you have about a third of teachers who are under 30 years, uh, whereas in Italy, you can barely find them in the education system. So a lot of variability in the share of young people. And then when you look at older teachers, Again, in the case of Italy, over half of the teachers are over 50 years. Um, in other countries uh, like uh, Singapore or Abu Dhabi, it's just a little bit more than one in 10. Um, and those demographics reflect various things. They reflect you know, teacher mobility. They reflect the demographics of the student population. Uh, if you have an expanding education system, you're likely to see more younger teachers. If you have a, a shrinking student population, you know, you likely see older teachers and so on. We also see the gender patterns across countries. You can see in the lower secondary stage, at least a large majority of teachers is female except for Japan, no? but in most countries you can see that clearly as a pattern, and that has implications uh, for the, you know, the people that students find in the classrooms. It has implications, again, for the attractiveness of the profession and things like this. So age and gender vary quite significantly across countries, and Thales tells us about this. Uh, what do teachers do in the classroom? Uh, in Thales, we found that about 80% of the time is spent on actual teaching and learning, as you would expect. Uh, but there is quite a bit of time also devoted to keeping order in the classroom, discipline, and then 8% for administrative tasks that don't really add at least directly value to student learning. So it's quite significant. And again, you'll see a wide variation in those components across countries that tell us that the uh, something about the organization of teaching. We also survey teachers and what they do beyond teaching. And you can see, for example, in Malaysia, 
teachers spend about five hours on school management, which is very rare in Finland. Uh, communication with parents, a big responsibility in the United Arab Emirates, not so common in Flanders, Belgium, and so on. Extracurricular activities, you can see Japanese teachers spending almost eight hours uh, per week working with students on extracurricular activities. So the social responsibilities that teachers in Japan have beyond, you know, delivery of instruction is very, very important. That's not very common in Sweden. No? Student counseling is something that is quite common in Korea, not so common in Finland. You can see Finland as a country where sort of teaching is really a major responsibility. The Asian countries standing out in general with ensuring that teachers have a holistic set of responsibilities that go well beyond teaching and also put quite a burden on teachers' work. So once again, those patterns become apparent through our TALIS survey. How do teachers actually get supported when they enter the profession? Induction is very important, mentoring, counseling when teachers enter. And you can see the percentage of teachers which uh, <clears throat> Uh, who are just young, you know, less uh, or new in the profession, less than three years experience and have access to formal induction uh, uh, programs. Now, that's basically the, the, the blue bar. And then the gray bar shows you who actually participate in such programs. Isn't that interesting? That's a wide gap. You know, if you look to Iceland and Finland, you know, anybody could be, or most teachers could be doing this, but actually only less than a third of teachers, you know, exercise that kind of work. A possibility. In contrast, when you look to the UK, it's generally deployed, generally available, and generally used. So again, practices across countries differ quite a bit on that score. Teacher professionalism. Of course, that's the heart of the Thales survey. We look at the knowledge that teachers have, at the discretion that they have over the organization of their work in terms of content, the course offerings, disciplinary practices, assessment policies, and we look at the collaborative nature of the job, the opportunities that teachers have to exchange and support needed to, to work with their colleagues to frame good practice. And again, just to illustrate, this thing can vary hugely across countries. You can look at Poland, uh, which is quite well developed on all three fronts, the knowledge of teachers, teachers' autonomy and professional culture. In contrast, when you look at Malaysia, you see a strong emphasis on the collaborative cultures. Teachers have plenty of opportunities to work together. And that's why this. Uh, and that is true in most of the Asian countries. In contrast, teacher professional autonomy is more limited and knowledge is so so. You can see quite distinct patterns across countries. You look at Italy, you know, teachers can do what they like, a very high degree of teacher professional autonomy, but not a strong collaborative culture, and the knowledge base is also below average. And so on. France is a country where the emphasis is on teacher knowledge, preparing teachers well, but then professional autonomy is limited, and the collaborative culture is also quite limited. So you can see from this, uh, this is about policy and practice. Now. These triangles are not about teachers as people, but about the environment that governments of public policy provides for them to develop. And you can sum it all up in a kind of index. You know, the blue part is knowledge, the uh, red part is the teacher professional autonomy, and the green part is about the, the collaborative culture. If you look, you know, Estonia comes out first, and you can see that is mainly because they leave their teachers really a lot of discretion over organizing organizing their work and managing their practices. The red bar is very, very long. If you look to Shanghai and China, you can see that there the green part is particularly large. Now, there's a very strong collaborative culture. Now, teachers teach fewer hours than teachers in other countries, but they spend a lot of hours working with their colleagues on research initiatives, on lesson, lesson study, on other forms of teacher, collab uh, teacher professional collaboration. So the bars are differently long. You, you can see basically in some countries, teacher professionalism is very high on the right side. In some, in others, it is not as high. But you can see also the, the composition varies quite a bit across countries. In some countries, a strong emphasis on knowledge, and others, a strong emphasis on professional autonomy, and yet others on the collaborative culture. 
uh, when it comes to collaboration, uh, we have looked at this in a little bit more detail and we can also see another pattern here. Basically, when it comes to professional collaboration in many countries, the emphasis is still on quite informal exchange and coordination. Now, teachers spend a lot of time on discussing individual student results or sharing resources, team conferences and so on. But when it comes really to the deeper layers of professional collaboration that matter most, classroom observation, joint activities, collaborative professional development, you can see they are still quite rare. So even in countries where there is a strong uh, uh, culture of collaboration, you can see sometimes those elements that matter most actually are not well developed. Of course, in, you know, that varies across countries. If you look, look, for example, to Australia, to Singapore, to China, collaborative professional development is very common. And in China, classroom observation is also the norm rather than the exception. But overall across countries, that is the pattern. And why do I say this? Because we see the more teachers teach jointly the same class, the more they observe other teachers' classes, the more they engage in joint activities or take part in professional collaborative learning, the greater their level of self-efficacy, their sense of being an effective teacher. And obviously, you know, your sense of being an effective teacher is not a guarantee that you are an effective teacher, but it's obviously a prerequisite. So Talis shows us those kinds of relationships. We also see differences in work organization. On the vertical axis of this chart, I show you the student staff ratio. And the lower you are on the chart, the more generous is the supply of teachers relative to the number of students. On the horizontal axis, you see the size of classes. And you might think that the student staff ratio and the class size should be related across countries. But you see here, all countries are all over the place. If you compare, for example, China with countries in the European Union, they are fairly similar in the student teacher ratio. Well, they deploy a similar number of teachers for every 100 students. But in Europe, classes tend to be very small. And in China, they tend to be very large. Now, again, you know, at first glance, you might think, well, Europe has an advantage. Teachers have smaller classes. But the downside of that is if you don't increase the number of teachers, that basically teachers have very little time for other things than teaching. By contrast, in China, you teach a larger class, but you have plenty of time to work with your colleagues to frame better practice, to do engage in research, to work with individual students, to work with parents. So actually, these survey data tell us something also about how the work of teachers is organized and what the expectations are on teachers in terms of framing their work. We survey teachers on you know, what makes them happy. And we can see, for example, one of the things that uh, was our hypothesis is that teachers are you know, more satisfied when they work in smaller classes. That's actually something that Thales didn't support. What you can see here is in the 2013 survey, basically teacher job satisfaction was pretty much the same for teachers in small classes and teachers in very large classes. Now, if you see that class size is not a driver of teacher job satisfaction, what then? Well, I bring you back to a teacher professional collaboration. What Talis data showed very clearly is that in countries with a high degree of teacher professionalism, uh, remember this is about the, the knowledge that teachers have, the degree of professional autonomy and the collaborative culture, there you can see that they tend to be satisfied with their profession and satisfied with the work environment. They also seem to show a greater degree of teacher self-efficacy and they see the status of teachers higher in society. So you can see teacher professionalism is not just something that we relate to the learning outcomes of students, but it seems to have also implications for the way in which teachers see their work and the way in which it is organized. Now, this was just a snapshot review on something that has happened in the past, but now I'm going to talk about what Thales 2018 is going to show in addition. The scope of Thales, uh, just, you know, in, uh, there were two, uh, 260,000 uh, teachers surveyed and 15,000 school. Uh, that makes it the, the largest uh, global survey on Thales, uh, on teachers ever done. And they represent actually more than 8 million teachers in the 48 countries that took part in this survey. 
And uh, if you just see this here in numbers, I have you know broken that up by level of education, where you see ISCID one, that's primary schooling, where you see ISCID two, that's the main part of the say, middle school or lower secondary education, and ISCID three is high school or upper secondary education. And then a few countries, uh, nine countries in 2018, actually did something very special. They linked the TALIS results with the results from our survey on learning outcomes, PESA, so that they can actually study how you know, the attributes of teaching and teachers actually relate to the environment in which students learn and the outcomes that students achieve. We're going to show results of this uh, next year. The participating countries and uh, in, in the TALIS survey, you can see them in red. These were the countries that also had done a previous uh, survey. And then you can see in green countries that have joined the TALIS survey in 2018 for the very first time. So you can see there's still a lot of gray spots on the map, but progressively more and more countries see the value in serving their teachers and also in comparing those outcomes across countries. Uh, there are two new thematic priorities that we have included this time. The first relates to the innovation capacity. That's obviously in the times in which we live particularly important. To what extent is there bottom-up innovation capacity in the system, organization and team innovativeness? And then we looked at diversity. As I said at the beginning, that's a major challenge in many countries. We knew that already from the previous survey where teachers often pointed to diversity in classroom as one of the major challenges for them and also needs for professional development. So we looked in greater detail at the social and cultural composition of their student body and uh, things like that. Uh, we've also added new content to basically further develop themes that we already looked at in the past. We looked at the commitment to the teaching profession, including why teachers join the profession, uh, we looked at teacher attrition, turnover in greater detail, and also at principals and teachers' career plans. We uh, looked at not only the degree of professional autonomy that teachers have, but also to what extent they are satisfied with this. And that's obviously a very important question. And then we looked at well-being of teachers, at workplace well-being and stress, and also the kind of drivers of stress, and the perception of the value and policy influence. Uh, uh, we asked teachers how would they invest additional resources uh, to achieve better outcomes. Let me just highlight this here. These were the topics that we uh, surveyed, and then the two new topics that we added are at the end, uh, innovation and equity and diversity. These 11 themes drive the reports and analysis that you will find in the TALIS reports. Uh, I show just a few examples. Now, when we, for example, survey teachers on their motivation to join the profession, uh, we asked teachers, you know, was it important to you whether teaching offered a steady career path, whether teaching provided a reliable income, whether teaching was a secure job, so stability. But we also asked questions like, teaching allow me to influence the development of children and young people, and the kind of social mission involved. Teaching, teaching allowed me to benefit the socially disadvantaged, or teaching allowed me to provide a contribution to society. So those two constructs were, uh, were surveyed. Uh, when I look at the innovation capacity, the other new element, we asked teachers whether they agree that most teachers in the school strive to develop new ideas for teaching and learning, whether most teachers in the school are open to change, whether most teachers in the school search for new ways to solve problems and whether most teachers in the school provide practical support to each other for the application of new ideas. Uh, teaching in multicultural or multilingual settings was also surveyed. Uh, you can see an example of the question on, this, on the chart here. And then uh, we surveyed teachers on, you know, if they had a choice, how government money is spent, how would they deploy it? No. Often, you know, those choices are being made at high levels of policy. They are political choices and teachers don't get a say in this. So we wanted to know, for example, whether they felt it was really important to invest in technology, in instructional materials, to support students from disadvantaged or migrant backgrounds, to reduce class size now by recruiting more staff, to improve school buildings and facilities, to support students with special needs, to offer high quality professional development for teachers, to get a better salary or to reduce teachers' administration load 
uh, with, with, with more support staff. No? So that will give us a sense of what teachers see as important in terms of resource allocations. Uh, in terms of their reporting, we're going to have two volumes. The one that we published on the 19th of June is on teachers and school leaders as lifelong learners. We look at the knowledge and skills of, uh, of professionals. And then volume two, that's going to come out in March next year, looks at uh, as career opportunities, professional responsibility and autonomy, collaborative communities among teachers, and the social value of teachers. So those are basically two major volumes. I'm also going to show you that a few additional publications that we have currently planned. If I talk through, the, through these volumes in greater detail, the first chapter is just an introduction and summary of the results for a general audience. The chap second chapter is on teaching and learning for the future. Uh, it looks at what teachers do in their classrooms and now teaching has changed. Now that's the great thing that we have actually kept a number of variables stable across the Thales survey. We can see how those constructs really evolve. It looks also at the extent to which teachers and school leaders engage in activities to support student learning and the extent to which teachers and schools are able to innovate their methods of teaching and collaborate. The third chapter looks at the changing landscape of teaching, now how the teaching landscape has changed since we did the Thales survey first in 2008. Uh, in terms of demographics, but also in the uh, context for teaching and learning, uh, diversity, school climate, learning climate, and so on. And then it looks at the resource issues that, if you ask teachers, are uh, particularly important. Um, the fourth chapter then looks at attracting and effectively preparing candidates, now how are teachers attracted to and prepared for the teaching profession initially, and then what support do they provide uh, receive in their early careers, the mentoring, support, uh, coaching, and so on. Chapter five then looks at opportunities for continuous development, participation, and need for training, and uh, teachers' view on, the, on what constitutes really effective and good training, and why they don't take part in training that they consider to be important. Um, I've already mentioned most of this. Um, the first volume, basically, you'll find around 250 pages of analysis and 250 page, pages with the data, and then about 60 chart. We are also going to put out a data set um, that uh, basically uh, you can use for further study and analysis, including the 260,000 observations, uh, principals, and teachers, and uh, the variables, there's going to be a technical report coming out on the 19th June, at least the preliminary version. And there is going to be a set of country notes, video materials, podcasts, in infographics to socialize the results from Thales and to present them to various audiences. And so it's a broad range of resources that you're going to find on the 19th of June. Just finally, what's going to come afterwards, towards the end of this year, we're going to put out a user's guide. Uh, that's basically introducing people into the Talus database and how to analyze it. So to facilitate further analysis, we are also going to put out the, from, the, from the nine countries, the link between PISA and Talus, and then an updated technical report basically completed with the Talus PISA link data sets. In March 2020 comes out the second volume, which I already mentioned, the teachers and school leaders as valued professionals, and the full data set for the middle schools and all of the TALIS options, parts one and two, and uh, volume two of the teacher's guide and other products. And then our idea is to actually produce some further, more thematically oriented reports in December, a report on schools performing against the odds. Now, where are schools and what are their characteristics that deliver good results despite a particularly challenging context? And then primary and upper secondary education teachers and principals. Now, that's basically from the optional components. And then in February 2022, a special report on equity issues across schools, teachers, and students. In a nutshell, that's what you can expect from Thales, and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. And I'm joined by uh, Karin Tremley and Pablo Fraser, who are actually the masterminds of the Thales survey and these reports. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. We've received several questions from our participants today.
So first question is on the emerging themes from TALIS. How are the emerging themes of innovation and teaching in diverse environments defined in TALIS 2018? Yes, good morning. Uh, the way we define uh, the innovation theme is uh, looking at uh, the extent to which uh, teachers in schools are open to new ideas and, uh, and ready to, to change, uh, uh, explore new ways of teaching, etc. So we've defined it in a very uh, vague way to enable uh, respondents to interpret it in, in their own way because it wasn't uh, too easy to, um, to provide very specific uh, innovations which would not necessarily be comparable across countries and not necessarily applicable across countries. In terms of diversity, uh, we have uh, been looking at it from different perspectives. So we're looking at the proportion of students with uh, a migrant background, uh, refugee students, because when we developed the instruments, we were in the middle of uh, the refugee crisis in, the, in European countries in particular, but we're also looking at uh, students from disadvantaged backgrounds and students with special needs. So we're really looking at all different aspects of diversity. Thank you, Karine. Uh, another question is on teacher professionalism. Uh, someone has said that teacher professionalism is not very clear. Could you explain it again? And why is network part of it? Yeah, maybe I, I'll start and hand over to my colleagues. Um, what we found when we analyzed all of the TALIS data from 2013, that actually the, the three dimensions, the knowledge that teachers have about you know, the subjects they teach, the pedagogy in which students learn that subject, and the knowledge they have about the student, the degree to which they have discretion and autonomy over the design of their learning environments, and the collaborative culture actually have a very significant influence over many aspects. You know, I, I the teacher job satisfaction, teacher self-efficacy, uh, including participation in professional development activities. We, we found that it was those three components that constituted a, a coherent construct of teacher professionalism that was related to many of the outcome variables that Thales uh, collects, but it's clear construct. You know, one can define teacher professionalism in in uh, many different ways. And if you, as you can see from the results themselves, you can see that countries define the construct in different way. You could see, for example, some countries giving great emphasis to teacher professional autonomy, others putting more emphasis on the collaborative culture, and yet others on uh, teachers' initial uh, preparation. So, this is a construct that we found through the analysis of the TALIS data. But I, I wonder whether my colleagues want to... Maybe just to add that uh, for, for the analysis which we did on the basis of the TALIS 2013 data, we were limited by the types of indicators which we had uh, in the TALIS 2013 survey. In 2018, we proposed to expand this analysis a bit further, and so we'll delve a bit deeper uh, into the contractual arrangements aspects of uh, professionalism and uh, the prestige and societal value uh, of, uh, of the profession. So we'll be able to explore five different pillars. We don't know how they will relate to both uh, job satisfaction and, uh, and self-efficacy, but we will look into these different aspects and so have a much broader uh, conceptual, uh, conception of uh, professionalism in, uh, in 2018 because uh, we've designed the questionnaire with uh, that uh, spirit in mind. Uh, the audience would also like to know which nine countries have linked PISA and TALIS. So we have Australia from many of them. Maybe we can we yeah, can collect that and yeah. come back to this. If you just come go on with the next question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So the next question. Think, sorry, it's Australia, the Czech Republic, Denmark, Turkey, Argentina, Colombia, Georgia, Malta, and Vietnam. Thank you, Karin. Okay, so the next question is, what is the biggest complaint of teachers in relation to their profession? And in, from your standpoint, the most important complaint? Well, you know, I think we wait until the 19th of June to tell you the results. <laughs> okay, uh, we have one question regarding substitute teachers. How can TALIS give us a policy useful picture of teachers' working conditions if substitute emergency and occasional teachers are excluded from the data, and what can be done to include them? Yeah, they're, they're indeed out of scope for, for the TALIS survey, so we don't have that information uh, for, for those types of teachers. That's something which we might consider in future rounds of uh, the survey, but so far it's not 
they're not uh, uh, in scope for the, for the analysis. Uh, next question, is there any study about the preparation of teachers and students to be prepared to deal with digital environments? We just completed uh, a study of initial teacher preparation in general. It wasn't necessarily looking at the digital environments. And we have colleagues uh, working uh, in our Center for Education Research and Innovation, which are looking more at uh, those types of issues. But Thales do has, uh, does have questions on uh, teachers' preparedness, uh, professional development needs uh, in relation to ICT competences. Okay, thank you, Karine. Um, there are, the next question is, there are some new perspectives about the future of higher education institutions, and one of them is that higher education institutions need to work in digital environments to cope with the future. Uh, that, okay, so that one is again about digital environments. Uh, the next question is again on digitalization. Someone has pointed out, I have a concern on this. Is the school prepared to deal with digital skills, skills and the humanization in education? Well, we will certainly get the perspective of teachers on this, so which they feel that is a challenge to which they need, uh, to the extent to which they feel they need better training on this. Uh, I think you'll get the teacher's view, but obviously it's a much broader question. And we will also get the views of principals on uh, what, in our view, uh, are the factors which uh, hinder uh, the delivery of quality education. And one of them is uh, the lack of uh, digital technology or, or teachers' uh, trend in, the, in those areas. So you will have that part of uh, the information. Okay, next question is, by what common variable do the teaser, uh, PISA TALIS link or, or merge? Is it by the individual teacher? No, all the link is done at the school, school level. level, so that's quite important to, to, to point out. We know what's happening uh, in schools uh, from the, on the basis of the TALIS data, and we can compare that to uh, student uh, reports and, uh, and student performance, but at the school level, so this is not an, an assessment of individual teachers. Okay, another question is, what evidence do we have that the teaching profession is becoming more complex? How do the TALIS results reflect this? Well, again, we will uh, talk about this on the 19th of June. But we obviously, we can look at many dimensions. We can look at diversity of career structures. We can look at uh, differences in preparation. We can look at demographics. We can, uh, there are many dimensions that TALIS really looks at. Thank you. Uh, there's one more question coming in. What are the enduring themes from the TALIS survey and how are they expand, expanding with the 2018 results? We might have already covered that, but maybe we could mm -hmm. go over it again. Okay. Yeah, issues around professional development, uh, training of teachers, these are really the themes which are uh, constant across uh, cycles and which will also uh, be re represented again in the future cycles of, uh, of TALIS. So that, yeah, that's probably, I mean, basically everything around building professionalism uh, are tend to be themes which are, which are recurrent. How do you expect the TALIS 2018 survey results to contribute or influence international teacher practice or the development of the profession? I think there are several dimensions to this. I mean, first of all, TALIS will give policymakers a be much better understanding of the needs of teachers, of the status of teachers, of their engagement in policies and in the, of the implementation of policies. I mean, in the end, you know, you have intended policies that that's what policymakers, you know, put into laws. You have implemented policies. That's what teachers actually, you know, do in the classroom and then achieve policies. What's actually going to be the outcome of this? And I think this is an important layer in that set that gives policymakers a much better understanding of how teachers see their work environment, the bottlenecks, the kind of uh, needs, also the priorities uh, teachers see for resource allocations. Uh, that's one layer. Uh, and we hope that uh, policymakers, we expect that policymakers will reflect on those results and take them into account when you know, advancing public policy and practice. Uh, but uh, we, it, we equally hope that it will inspire teachers themselves, the teaching profession, to you know, look outwards. Basically, what TALIS does through its comparative perspectives, it allows the teaching profession to 
you know, expand the horizon. How do other teachers in other countries work, how they collaborate, how they design their learning environments. And uh, that perspective hopefully will have, you know, implications of how teachers see their job. And uh, so there are many layers in which we expect and also from the past. Uh, and, and last but not least, our, our hope is that Thales will contribute to raise the status of the teaching profession by uh, showing the general public uh, how demanding and complex this job is, uh, uh, level of commitment that we see in the teaching profession. And uh, uh, I, I do think that is of crucial importance. Many. OECD countries face major difficulties in recruiting talented people. And sometimes despite paying actually reasonable salaries, uh, it's not just a matter of you know, the material conditions, but also the conditions that keep the job professionally and intellectually attractive. So uh, that's our expectation and hope that Thales will contribute to you know, uh, raise the status of the teaching profession. Okay, the next question is on the difference between the two volumes released this year and in 2020. Will the teacher stress and well-being policy, policy influence results be released this month in 2019 or in 2020? That comes out in March 2020. Uh, a major complaint from new teacher education graduates is that they were not taught enough about classroom management and assessment. How has TALIS approached these two key issues? Well, actually, Thales asks teachers those kinds of questions, so we can actually see, and we, we know the demographics, we know the age of teachers and the background, so we can exactly look at to what extent um, that is a relevant concern for which age group. And we've done that in the past, actually, classroom management uh, that has been studied in the past. Another question here, um, how are student and parental factors accounted for in the Thales survey? Well, we ask uh, teachers and school leaders to describe their social demographic context. And I must say, this is a basically uh, a more qualitative assessment by teachers. Only for the countries that do the Thales PISA link do we have an exact sense of the social demographic context of the school. And so that uh, is, in, in this case, sense, a more qualitative description of their context. We ask. Uh, uh, principles of, you know, to, to, to what extent diversity in the school student composition plays a role and so on. And uh, but that's uh, it's only for the PISA, Thales, link countries that we can actually quantify this in exact terms. I think we have time for just one more question. Uh, are there any clear local or geographical splits in terms of the emerging themes addressed in, in Thales, so difference across countries? Yeah, again, you know, that's going to come out on the 19th of June. We will actually uh, uh, look at that dimension as well. Okay, thank you, Andreas, and thank you to all of our participants for your interest in this topic and the OECs working on education in general. Let me remind everyone that the latest results uh, for TALIS will be launched on June 19th, and you can find out more about that on our website and our Twitter page. Uh, the webinar that you've watched today has been recorded and will be made available online. Once again, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you.